By way of announcement, the Word of God is the most important thing that we can stuff into our souls. Therefore, there's going to be uh, some additions to our classes. There'll be a class on Tuesday night at 7 o'clock and a class on Thursday at 7 o'clock. And if you want to attend, you can. If not, that's your prerogative. But I'll be here and it'll be on tape if you're not available. Uh, so therefore, the next few moments will be devoted to silent prayer. That will give each of you the privacy of your priesthood to name your sins to God. And as a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, you have this opportunity so that you can be filled with God the Holy Spirit. As God the Holy Spirit is our mentor and our teacher and the one who brings to our memory those things that are forgotten. So it is of utmost importance that all of us are in fellowship so that we might learn these things, which is called in the Greek pneumatikos, that spiritual phenomenon. Without the filling of God the Holy Spirit, you cannot have spiritual phenomenon. You cannot learn the things of the Word without the filling of God the Holy Spirit. The Bible says those who worship Him must worship Him in spirit. And that is because if you are carnal, you cannot, and carnal means that you are in a state of sin, and we'll be studying this today. And if you are in a state of sin... Under carnality, you cannot understand the things of the Word of God. Therefore, the next few moments will be devoted to silent prayer, giving you the opportunity to utilize 1 John 1, 9, which states, If we name our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to purify us from all wrongdoing. Therefore, with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, let's pray. Father, we thank you for the wonderful opportunity to study your word this morning. May God, the Holy Spirit, give us the concentration and enlighten us so that we might grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, last week, do you remember what we were studying? It seems like an eternity for me going from Sunday to Sunday. And if you uh, don't remember, then we uh, obviously need to have more classes, and that's why I made that <coughs> announcement. The rate of learning must always exceed the rate of forgetting. If you forget all the doctrine that you've learned twice on a Sunday, then it's done you no good through the week. So last week, if you remember, we studied the Trinity. And we went through that, and we went through the abode of God. That is, where does God dwell? And we uh, found out that, in fact, God is in every believer. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit actually indwell every believer and there's actually a Shekinah glory within your own body. And we studied that last week. Now we're going to begin a study of sin. Now we studied rebound, 1 John 1, 9. If we name our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to purify us from all wrongdoing. Now we're going to begin a study of sin. What is sin? And this is very important because there are taboos people think is sin, which is not sin. And there are lots of uh sins that people commit and they don't even realize they're committing a sin. So this uh, study will be on sin and this might go for three or four <coughs> messages, maybe even more, because there's a lot related to homodiology and homodiology is the study of sin. Therefore, let's take down the definition of sin. Sin, this is the definition. Sin is anything contrary to the character of God. It's acting independently of God and God's provision. Sin is coming short of God's righteousness, and we all do this. Every single one of us who breathes here today and everyone in the whole world has sinned and come short of the glory of God. That's found in Romans 3.23. Romans 3.23 states, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And that's Romans 3.23. So therefore, a repetition of the definition, sin is anything contrary to the character of God, acting independently of God and God's provision. Sin is coming short of God's righteousness, and of course we all do this without exception. Even after we believe in Christ, we commit sin, and if you think you don't, you're a fool. Point two. All sins are not the same. You know, somebody might say, well, all sins are the same. Not to God, they're not. All sins are not the same. God knew about all sins in eternity past. God knew simultaneously every sin that we would ever commit. And not only our sins, but the sins of the entire human race. 
are known by God. Point two, all sins are not the same to God. They never have been. And God knew about all of our sins in eternity past. God knew simultaneously every sin we would ever commit, and not only just our sins, but the sins of the entire human race. And therefore, that deals with unlimited atonement. Jesus Christ died on the cross, was judged for the sins of everyone, believer and unbeliever, he was judged. It is not, um, he did not die just for the believer. He died for the ungodly, as it says in your Bible. That means the unbeliever. Therefore, there is an unlimited atonement. Jesus Christ died on the cross as a substitute for everyone, unbeliever and believer. All it takes is someone to believe in Christ, and therefore they are saved. Point three, while all sins are not the same to God, the solution to sins is the same. Now, some sins are worse than others, believe it or not, and there will be a listing later on of the worst sins that we'll find in Proverbs. Some sins are not as uh, bad, so to say, as others, yet all of them result in the same thing, and that is you are out of fellowship, and there is a solution to that, and that solution is the same in every case. And the reason for this lies in the fact that God has perfect righteousness, he has perfect justice, and perfect love. And what the righteousness of God demands, the justice of God executes. And the righteousness of God, of course, condemned all sins in human history, and therefore they were judged on the cross. And that's why Jesus Christ died as a substitute for us on the cross. And this is called, in theology, substitutionary atonement. Now you're getting stuff here that you cannot get right now probably in Dallas Theological Seminary. You can get some of it. They still teach substitutionary atonement, but some of these things are uh, have been taught and there's been a great movement in this country of apostasy. So uh, count yourself lucky. The justice of God judged every sin in human history so that the love of God can provide the solution as expressed in the grace of God, and that's found in Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. It is by grace that you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And there are many men today boasting about how they're working their way into heaven, and they cannot. Jesus Christ did it on the cross. Point four. Now there is a heresy out there that uh, states that uh, there was forgiveness at the cross. And uh, this heresy has surprisingly, uh, some pastors have come out of Baraka Church and they have said uh, that uh, Jesus Christ forgave all sins at the cross. If that were the case, you wouldn't even have to believe in Christ. You would immediately be saved. All sins were judged at the cross. So there was no forgiveness at the cross. There was no forgiveness at the cross. There was judgment at the cross. God the Father judged all sins in the perfect humanity of Jesus Christ. Forgiveness is the result of the cross. And if you believe in Christ, all pre, pre-salvation sins are blotted out. You're, you have a clean slate. And if Christ, as I said, had forgiven all sins on the cross, there would be no need for anyone to believe in Christ because all would have been automatically forgiven. But these thoughts are heresy, and it is taught, and you might not have heard it, but if you come across it, realize that it is a false doctrine. There was simply judgment on the cross, and not simply because that judgment was extremely painful for our Lord. And this heresy got started because of Ephesians 1, 7 and their misunderstanding of it. And if you want to, you can turn your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7. Ephesians 1, 7. And here it states, By Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of His grace. By Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of His grace. Now some people have looked at that and said, See, there's forgiveness at the cross, but that's not the case. Redemption, and this is getting into the Greek, redemption is in the accusative case. And forgiveness is also in the accusative case, and that means this is the object of result. That This is not Koine Greek, and there's no accusative apposition in the English language, or in the Greek language, there is in the English, there's not in the Greek, there is not an accusative of apposition, and uh, there is no such thing as an accusative of apposition in the Greek language. Therefore, what this is saying is that as a result 
of the redemptive work of Christ on the cross. We have forgiveness of sins, of course, when we believe in Christ. So therefore, we have to take a look at this uh, doctrine from the standpoint of what happens when we sin, what do we do, and when does forgiveness of sin occur? And we'll take a look at this, point one, and this is under, When Does Forgiveness of Sin Occur? And that should be the title of these next three points that I'm going to give you. Point one, all pre-salvation sins, that is, sins that you have committed before you believe in Christ, all pre-salvation sins are forgiven the moment we believe in Christ. Point one, all pre-salvation sins are forgiven the moment we believe in Jesus Christ. Point two, all post-salvation sins, those are sins that we commit after we're saved, and we do commit sins after we're saved, as we studied over and over again by 1 John 1.8 and 1 John 1.10, which states that all of us are sinners in every uh, way, and we cannot eradicate from us the sin nature, yet God has given us a solution to our sins. So all po post-salvation sins are forgiven the moment we obey 1 John 1, 9, and acknowledge our sins. God is faithful and righteous to forgive us because Christ never lost his perfect righteousness of his human nature while he was being judged for the sins of the human race. And not only does God the Father forgive us the sins we acknowledge, but he forgives us of all wrongdoing. That means, for example, you haven't studied uh, sin yet. You haven't just studied all the things that are sin. Let's say you commit a sin that you know is a sin and you name it. As a result, all those sins that you do not know are sins are forgiven. And that's part of the grace of God. And uh, so, uh, point two again, all post-salvation sins are forgiven the moment we obey 1 John 1, 9 and acknowledge our sins. And we'll move on to point three. All the sins of the unbeliever are never forgiven. All the sins of the unbeliever, that is, though that person who never believes in Christ, and when he dies, his sins were never forgiven. And that's because this person never believed in Jesus Christ. And therefore, they did not do what Scripture says. And there's lots of Scripture in the Bible on what you do for salvation. And it's very simple. John 3.15, that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. John 3.16, for God so loved the world so much that he gave his uniquely born Son in order that whoever believes in him may never perish but have eternal life. John 3.18, He who believes in him is not judged, but he who does not believe has been judged already because he has not believed in the unique person of the Son of God, of Jesus Christ. Therefore, it's found in Scripture the only way of salvation is to simply believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and nothing else. All the sins of the unbeliever, this is point three, are never forgiven because this person never believed in Christ. These sins, however, are never used in judgment of the unbeliever. A pastor may tell you all the sins you've ever committed when you die, they're going to be shown to you by God. That is not the case. That's not found in Scripture. That's a legalistic lie. It's not true because Christ was judged for all sins. The unbeliever is judged simply because he has never believed in Jesus Christ, and that is the only sin Jesus Christ did not die for on the cross. And... So Jesus Christ, when he uh, bore all our sins on the cross, he did not die for the sin of rejection of him. And if you reject Christ, you will go to hell. And that's it, it's as plain as I can put it. So, the, But the study we're going to deal with now be, uh, with sin is uh, dealing particularly with the Christians, since I assume all of us here are Christians. And so uh, we're going to relate all of this sin to what we do as believers in the uh, Lord Jesus Christ. And there's something that we all need to know about ourselves, and that's the fact that we have something in us called the old sin nature. There is something in us called the old sin nature. In fact, we are born with the old sin nature, and as a believer, the sin nature gains control of our souls through our personal sin, and when we sin, we are said to become carnal, and therefore the solution is 1 John 1.9. So all of us have an old sin nature, and I'll write this up here on this new little neat projector we got. We all have an old 
than nature. Now there's something funny about the old sin nature in that there's actually I'll make a circle here with a slice in it there's an area of strength and there's an area of weakness. Now your area of strength up here on the board is that which uh, you might never think of committing a sin in that area. For example, you might steal a song book from a church and see, well, you'll see somebody stealing the song book from the church and you'll say, well, I would never do anything like that. Well, that's your area of strength. That's not your weakness. Uh, you don't, uh, you're not a kleptomaniac. That's not your weakness. Yet, uh, you might have another weakness. Maybe uh, your weakness is gossip, and it is because you're gossiping about that person who's stealing the Bible. So your area of weakness is different, and therefore this is when we get into uh, where people talk about each other all the time, and uh, one person will say, well, did you, did you see that person drinking a glass of wine? And they call themselves a Christian, and that's their area of strength, but it's not really strength, but it's in their sin nature, and they say, I would never touch a glass of wine, and of course, we'll get into taboos. It's uh, not a sin to drink a glass of wine. It is a sin to get uh, drunk, of course. It's a sin to overindulge yourself on wine. In fact, it's a sin to overindulge yourself on food, and that's called gluttony. So there are a lot of sins that we're going to get into, and uh, now if you're, uh, as I said last week, if you're too young to drink, don't drink. It's against the law. Therefore, it is a sin. Don't break the law. You can only drink when you're 21 or older, and that's the law of the land, and that's what we have to follow. So therefore, we have an area of strength and an area of weakness, and we'll get into this more in a few moments. And of course, the solution to sin is the same as we've been studying, and that's 1 John 1, 9. So therefore, we have carnality versus spirituality. You can either be carnal or you can be spiritual. Now, if you're in a state of sin, you are said to be carnal. Now, you might know all of this already. This is a basic series, and it's a good foundation because after a while, when I get to Matthew, when I get back to Matthew, we're going to be uh, learning a lot more advanced things. So we have carnal and we have spiritual. Now, you can't tell if somebody is spiritual. Now, a lot of people try to act spiritual, and they'll say, uh, they'll use a lot of epigrams and say, will the Lord willing, and uh, by the name of the Lord. And we studied that when we were studying Saul, how he always used the Lord. He invoked the Lord's name. That doesn't mean that person's spiritual. In fact, that person could be extremely carnal. And you cannot tell if somebody is spiritual because the spirit is invisible. Only you know if you're spiritual, and how are you spiritual? First John 1, 9. It's very important. If you name your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive you your sins and to purify you from all wrongdoing. Therefore, if you name your sins to God, then at that moment you are spiritual. You are filled with God the Holy Spirit, and then you are able to uh, follow up with the filling of God the Holy Spirit and follow up with the Word of God, which is of utmost importance. As David said, on thy word I meditate both day and night. And he said that in the Psalms. And that is how you are spiritual. Your meditation upon the word of God, that means you're listening to it every day, at least an hour a day. I've listened to it a lot more than that, but an hour a day should do. And uh, you can grow up spiritually by listening to an hour a day, not twice on Sunday. That's not enough. And that's why we're expanding the, uh, the number of classes taught. And if I can hold up with those two classes during the week, I'll probably even add a few more once I get some lessons ahead. And if you want to come, that's your prerogative, but I'll be here, and if uh, nobody's here, I'll make a tape. I think my wife will be here if she don't have to work over it. So it'll be a few people anyway. And it doesn't matter because the Bible says where two or more are gathered together, I'll be there with them. So we have categories of sin. Let's continue. I just uh, told you the difference between carnality and spirituality, and I might need to say a few more things about that because uh, spirituality is an absolute. That means you can't be partially spiritual. You can't be 50% spiritual. You are either 100% spiritual or 0% spiritual. You're either carnal or spiritual. And at points we are carnal, and at points we are spiritual, and the 
more you grow up in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, there will be more time that you spend in spirituality because you, you bounce on rebound every time you get a chance. And that should be foremost in your mind as a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ that when you sin, you should always be thinking about 1 John 1, 9. And we all sin, and we commit sins over and over again. Remember last week I talked about the ladies who gossip all the time where I work, and I guess that might be gossip on my part, right? <laughs> but anyway, you name your sins to God, and then uh, you name that sin of gossip over and over again, and you say, God's going to get tired of me. No, he's not. He's faithful. That means he'll forgive you every time. So therefore, let's move now into the general categories of sin. There are general categories of sin that we're going to note right now. The first is imputed sin. The entire human race was counted guilty when Adam sinned. We are all guilty. At the point of birth, we're all guilty. And in fact, when we are born, we are born under sin. And so you say, well... What if a baby dies? Does it go to hell? Of course not. If a baby dies, he has not reached accountability yet. That means he has not reached God consciousness. The baby will go to heaven. If a baby dies two, three months, two, three years, or whatever, and during that stage before they can have any knowledge of God, that baby automatically goes to heaven. And you say, how do I know that? I know that from uh, King David. When his son died, his firstborn son died, he said, I can uh, he cannot come to me, but I will go to him. So his baby went to heaven, and of course David was a believer, and he went to heaven. And right now he's joined with his firstborn son who died uh, shortly after birth. So the entire human race was counted guilty when Adam sinned. And 1 Corinthians 15.22 says, For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. And then in Romans 3.23, which we just noted, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And another one is Romans 5.12. Romans 5.12. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for all have sinned. Therefore we have the imputation of all the sins of the... Of the imputation of all sins. In other words, we are imputed at the point of birth with the old sin nature. And uh, actually, the, the old sin nature actually begins at the moment of conception. It's not functional. And that doesn't mean a pregnant woman has two functional sin natures. It might seem that way, but it's, it's not true. There's only one sin nature, and uh, therefore the sin nature of the fetus is not yet functional until birth. And once that fetus is born... There is therefore uh, human, uh, human life, and there is uh, the sin nature becomes active. Point two, there is inherent sin. Now, point one was imputed sin. Now, point two, inherent sin. Now, when Adam sinned, we acquired an old sin nature. Therefore, the old sin nature was brought into existence by Adam. And the human race inherits the old sin nature through physical birth from the chromosomes of the father. The sin nature comes from the chromosomes of the father. And I was telling uh, somebody this years ago, back when I was a teenager, I didn't, I knew some doctrine back then. I didn't know how to explain things as well as I do now. But uh, I was telling them, yes, that the sin nature comes from the chromosomes of the father. And they thought that was hilarious. So I didn't think it was funny. But to the unbeliever, a lot of these things are foolishness. And this it comes from the Psalms, actually. The fact that the father carries the sin nature comes from the Psalms, and that's Psalms 51, 5. And this is where it says, Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. That doesn't mean she was uh, having sex out of wedlock. This is, uh, now some people would look at that and say, Well, my mother conceived me in sin. No, what this means is that the father had the old sin nature in the sperm, in the chromosomes of the sperm, and therefore when the egg was fertilized, the sin nature was transferred. And that's what Psalms 51.5 was. And therefore David was shapen in iniquity. And what's iniquity? Sin. So from the very moment in his womb, the sin nature was there. It was dormant and then became active when um, David was born. And as we noted, it became very active when he saw Bathsheba. 
So therefore, every member of the human race retains the old sin nature after salvation, just as David did. David was not only a believer, but a mature believer, and he committed these terrible sins of adultery and murder. Therefore, Adam is a sinner and saved through grace, just like every one of us. Every one of us is a sinner, and we are saved by grace. And personal sin is therefore, all the personal sins you commit, is a manifestation of the fact that within us, is an old sin nature, and that's found in 1 John 1, 1.8 and 1 John 1.10. Now, there are two kinds of personal sin. There are known sins, and there are unknown sins. Uh, once you grow up spiritually, you pretty much get a handle on the uh, doctrine of homardiology. You pretty much know what is sin and what is not. But when you're a baby believer or when you're growing up as a believer, you don't know all of the sins, and therefore you will commit sins that you don't know about. You won't even know that you're sinning. Uh, for example, if I were going down 85 today, like uh, when you start out in Spartanburg, it's uh, 65. That means you can go about 70. So it's 65 in Spartanburg, and we're going about 70. And then once you get toward Greenville, they do a stupid thing on that beautiful six-lane highway and drop it. To 60 miles an hour. Let's say you didn't see that. You didn't see that sign that said 60, and you're going along at 70, and you get pulled over, and the police officer says to you, uh, do you know how fast you're going? Yes, sir, I was going 70. Do you know the speed limit is 60? Well, no, I wasn't aware of that. And then he'll give you a ticket anyway. So you're still guilty for going over the speed limit, whether you know it or not. And it's the same way with sin. Whether you know it or not, you're guilty of it. And therefore, we have to go back to the garden to see where the separation of the sin of ignorance and the sin of cognizance began. And cognizance means that you're simply aware of those sins. There are some sins we commit, we're aware of it, and yet we do it anyway out of our own arrogance, and then we can rebound and get back with it. But of course, we commit known sins, and we commit unknown sins, those things we don't even know are sins. And so we have to go back to the garden, back to Adam and Eve. Now, Adam was created first by God, and uh, in fact it says man was made in his own image. That doesn't mean God looks like a man. That's talking about the soul. The soul was made in his own image. God is a spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit. So therefore, God does not look like a man. Now, the humanity of Christ looks like a man. He came to earth as a man, and he's resurrected today as a man. So we will be able to meet face-to-face -face our Lord Jesus Christ in his humanity, but we will never get to see uh, God the Father, as it were, because he is a spirit. And in fact, it'll probably just be light when we get to heaven. That's how God the Father will look to us. So we begin with Adam, who was created. Now, Adam was made ruler over the earth, and, uh, the, and also he was given the responsibility to name all the animals and all the creatures and everything in it. So he was a genius. Of course, he was actually a perfect man and the smartest man who has ever existed outside of our, our Lord, of course, but he had a spiritual genius, and that's different than a physical genius, but Adam was perfect, created perfect, and you say, well, how is perfect sin? Well, by choice. So Adam was created perfect, and he came, uh, and God made him, and he's walking around, and he's naming all the animals, and he sees, all of a sudden, he starts to notice something that's funny to him, and he sees a female dog, and then there's a male dog, and he looks at all of them, and he sees that each animal has a female and a male, and so he starts to wonder, where, where's my mate? It'd be like going to the beach with your dog, and you're walking around on the beach, and you say, where are the babes? There's none there, of course. And so uh, you want to, uh, it's just a natural thing that happened to him. And of course, God solves all problems. And Adam had a problem. He got lonely because he noticed he did not have a mate. So God put him in a deep sleep. And uh, of course, that's where he took out the rib. And he built, that's what it says in the Hebrew, he built a woman. And young people today like to say she's built like a brick house. Well, uh, Eve was beautiful, the most beautiful woman ever created. And when she was created, um, Adam woke up from his sleep and he looked over and he saw this beautiful thing next to him. And do you know what he said? He said, at last! 
and said, At last, bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. So he was excited, apparently. And then we note in Genesis 2.25, now this is something of significance, and it's not part of the, the sin that we're studying, but it's of significance, so I'll tell you about it. In Genesis 2.25 it says, And they were both ma- naked, the man and his wife, and they were not ashamed. Now in fornication today, if you commit fornication, there is shame involved in that. You will have shame. You will in fact probably have a guilt reaction. And uh, if you commit adultery, there is shame in that. There was no shame between Adam and Eve. And in fact, they were both naked and they didn't care. They were, and, uh, they were in fact immediately uh, married in a wedding ceremony. And that wedding ceremony was their sexual intercourse. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and they were not ashamed. So after they had sexual intercourse, not ashamed. But if you commit fornication, you will be ashamed. And it builds up scar tissue on your soul if you do these kinds of things. And uh, therefore, uh, a lot of marriages are ruined, as I've said before, in the back seats of cars before they even get started. And um, a lot of times, fornication can do that. But that, but through rebound, and if you've uh, been involved in this, don't blush. Through rebound, you can uh, regain your spiritual life. You can grow in grace and in knowledge. And in fact, uh, the bird with the broken wing flies ever higher. It does not crash. Uh, the legalist thinks the bird with the broken wing will fall down and crash. No, it flies ever higher by the grace of God, and that is grace. <clears throat> so therefore, as I just said, they were both naked and not ashamed. Now we have a sequence to sin. There's a sequence to sin that we're going to study. Imputed sin results in spiritual death. When Adam sinned, the entire human race sinned. Therefore, man is born spiritually dead, and he needs a new birth. And that's why Jesus told uh, Nicodemus, you must be born again. He didn't understand what Jesus was saying, but he was saying you must be uh, born again, of, uh, have a new birth of the spiritual life, or in that case, uh, have the spiritual birth. That is, we are dichotomous before we believe in Christ. We only have a soul and a body, and after we believe in Christ, we are called trichotomists. That means we have a soul, a body, and a human spirit, so the new birth is the birth of the human spirit. It doesn't mean a a drastic change in lifestyle or anything like that. A lot of people say you're born again. You've had a drastic change in lifestyle. You threw away your cigarettes. You got rid of your wine bottles. Well, that's not the case, and in fact, those are just taboos. It's not a sin to smoke, by the way. That's a taboo. You're not sinning if you light up a cigarette. <clears throat> and that's a fact. And you say, but it, isn't it harmful for your body? Well, yes, it might be unhealthy, but so is a cheeseburger in excess. So it has nothing to do with that. And you say, well, what about the, the temple? Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Yes, it is. That means you need to be filled with God the Holy Spirit. That means you need to name your sins. You see, it's spiritual. An unbeliever can quit smoking. That doesn't mean he's saved. An unbeliever can quit drinking. That doesn't mean he's saved. The only way of salvation is to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. So we'll address these taboos, and I'll get into this more, and you'll have a greater understanding of it, that there's a difference between sin and taboo. And uh, it is a taboo, especially nowadays, not so much in the South, but if you go to other parts of the country, there's a great anti-smoking movement. Well, that's a, it's part of the taboo. It's tar- part of the taboo culture. And I'm not encouraging anyone to smoke, of course. It is unhealthy. And you might want to quit if you do. But uh, that's your own decision, and it has nothing to do with your spiritual life. It's not a spiritual matter. Uh, It's just like if you want to take a vitamin, it will be healthy for you to take a vitamin in the morning. And if you don't, well, you're not sinning. If you don't, then that would be foolishness. So therefore, there is imputed sin that results in spiritual death. And there is, point two, inherent sin. There is inherent sin. When Adam sinned, he acquired an old sin nature, and this brought the old sin nature into existence. And point three there is personal sin. The human race sins personally because of the presence of the old sin nature before and after salvation. (coughs) So before and after salvation, we have the old sin nature. Now we'll start to look at the work on the cross regarding our sin. 
the work on the cross regarding our sin. Now, we haven't got into the categories of sin and what sin is, but we'll be getting to that in the next message, and we'll get a good look at all the different sins that uh, you can commit and probably have in a lot of cases. So we have the work of the cross. Now, in imputed sin, we are counted guilty. That's in 1 Corinthians 15.22 and Romans 3.23. And uh, while in Christ, we are counted not guilty. Christ took the guilt for us. We are not guilty in Christ. We believe in Christ. We are counted not guilty. That's found in 1 Corinthians 15.22b and 2 Corinthians 5.21 and Ephesians 2.1 and Ephesians uh, 5-6. Point two, inherent sin. Jesus Christ died with reference to everyone's old sin nature. He made provision to handle sins from the old sin nature. That's found in 1 John 1, 7. And he rejected human good. What's human good? Human good also comes from this area of strength. That's where human good comes from. In other words, you, uh, you give to the poor. You see a homeless guy and you say... Here's some change, buddy. And you give him some change, and you think you've done a good work, and you've done a good work. But if you're under the sin nature, under this area of strength up here, it's worthless. It's wood, hay, and stubble as found in Corinthians, and it will be burned at the Bema. Now, if you're filled with God the Holy Spirit, and you do something like that, maybe uh, help somebody out, or uh, do some uh, work, uh, actually it's called in the Bible, good of intrinsic value, and in fact, the greatest good of intrinsic value is being here and listening to the Word and doing that, and therefore that's counted for you. Now, if you're here under the sin nature, it's wood, hay, and stubble. It will be burned, and it means nothing. So you have to be in the filling of God the Holy Spirit through 1 John 1, 9. So he rejected human good, and that means uh, Christ rejected human good of the old sin nature. That means that it, that's uh, found in Isaiah 64, 6. <laughs> All of our righteous deeds are as filthy rags. And uh, the corrected translation, it's a little crude, but I'm going to give it to you anyway. The corrected translation from the Hebrew says, All of your righteous deeds are as menstrual rags. And that's what the Hebrew says. And that's why it lets us know very clearly that the good works we do outside of fellowship or the good works we do as an unbeliever add up to menstrual rags. You try to get to heaven with that stuff and you're an idiot. You, you get to heaven by believing in Christ, not by menstrual rags. And that's what Isaiah uh, 64, 6 actually says. And uh, there are other things uh, related to this. Let's look at personal sin. Jesus Christ bore the sins of everyone. Jesus Christ bore the sins of everyone. And in the case of personal sins, of course, as the believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, you utilize 1 John 1, 9. And the penalty of sin is spiritual death. And this is uh, replaced by the provision of spiritual life for anyone who believes in Christ. And that's found in Romans 6, 23 and Matthew 27, 46. Now, in the next hour, after we have our break, actually probably the next 45 minutes uh, after the break, we're going to talk about the issue of sin, and then we're going to get into the actual uh, delineation of all the different sins that uh, we can commit. Now, some of these things, I said menstrual rags, some of you uh, kind of had a funny look on your face. Well, it's the Word of God, and I have to teach it, and I'm not going to back down from it. I'm going to teach what it says. And if you, you can win, so you win. Yeah, it's gross, but that's what it says in the Bible. And the Bible is oftentimes plain spoken. There is no legalism in the Bible. There is no uh, uppity upness or whatever you want to call it. The Bible is very clear when it comes to what it wants to communicate to you. And what the Bible wanted to communicate to you is the fact that your human good is gross. It's gross in God's sight, and that's what it wants to tell you. It is, and it says it very clearly. Now, the translators in your Bible didn't put it in because they're a little scared. But you can't be scared when it comes to the Word of God because the Word of God is of utmost importance and you have to understand it and you have to understand what it's conveying. And it's conveying to you that your human good is gross 
absolutely and totally gross. You cannot re receive salvation from your human good. And the Bible makes it very clear how you receive salvation. You can work from, from now till doomsday to try to get into heaven. You're not going to get there. You can say, I'm a good man, I'm a good husband, I'm a good father. That's not going to get you into a heaven. There are a lot of good people who you would consider good today burning in hell. And it's a sad thing, but it's a true fact that there are a lot of people there are some wonderful Jewish people who have never believed in the Lord Jesus Christ and they uh, served under Judaism and they went under Judaism and they had great morals and they never cheated on their spouse, they never did um, anything like that and they lived under divine establishment and they lived a happy life and they died and they went to hell. And why did they go to hell? Because they did not believe in Jesus Christ. And that's what we have to do for our salvation. You are not saved because of what you do, because our righteousness are as filthy rags, as it's translated in your Bible, but as it's translated in the Hebrew, is minstrel rags. And if you can't take that, then maybe you shouldn't be here, because this is going to be a place where the Word of God is going to be taught. And if I have to teach to two people, well, fine. I'm going to teach it because it is of utmost importance. Therefore, with your heads bowed and your eyes closed. Father, we thank you for the wonderful opportunity this morning to study your word. May the things that we have noted become a source of blessing and challenge to our life so that we might grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior. And Father, we pray for our president who is dealing with a war. And while uh, we live right now in peace, there are people fighting overseas for us, fighting in far reaches of the land, fighting in hot deserts, and we pray for them that uh, you might keep them safe and uh, keep them from harm. And may they destroy our enemy as they need to be destroyed. And therefore, Father, we pray for them. And we pray for our president that you will give him wisdom and counsel. And may uh, you uh, give him great wisdom in his counsel. And may you confuse the counsel of our enemy. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen.